This morning, we are in our second lesson looking at our plea. And just like last week, our plea is to return to the Bible. And this morning, I want to encourage all to return to God's plan for man's salvation. If you ever have talked to individuals from different denominations, or maybe those who aren't a member of any denomination, they're just religious, as they like to say, and you hear their opinion about what it takes to become a to become saved or to get saved, as they might say sometimes. And you know, what you'll find is sometimes there are a wide variety of different ideas floating around out there. And sadly, even within the body of Christ, there are those who hold to ideas which are contrary, which are against what God's Word actually teaches. And so our plea is to return to the Lord's plan of salvation. The plan of salvation is not man's plan. It must be God's plan. Again, if you ever want to see what some groups believe, you can go onto their website and some will say what they believe and some will kind of beat around the bush about it. And you'll see what they teach on matters of salvation. And you'll find that it is far different than what we find within the Word of God. And so let's begin this morning by looking at our first point, which simply is salvation is in no other name. You look at Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. The Bible says, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. That means simply that we must be a part of the body of Christ. We are saved in accordance to the commands of Christ. Would you believe that there are those today who would tell you in order to be a part of their denomination, in order to be saved, you have to be able to speak in tongues? Well, that's going to be an impossibility, isn't it? There are those today who say if you're going to be a part of their denomination, that you're going to have to sign a form that allows them to draft your bank account week after week. And we find various other things that we see throughout the world today that make it harder to become a member of a denomination than it does to become a member of the New Testament, or to become a New Testament Christian, we should say. No other name means in no other church. Denominations do not teach the same plan that Christ taught. If you look at Matthew chapter, 5, Matthew chapter 15 and verse 9, here Christ says, In vain they worship me, teaching us doctrines and commandments of men. Now their commandments is not just the commandments of worship, but various different commandments. He says, plural, their commandments of men. Well, those commandments could also include their commandments I want it meant to be saved. You know, even in the New Testament, Paul had to argue with those who believed that unless you were circumcised, you could not be saved. And of course, we know, speaking of those there in Rome and other places, you had to teach against that. What were they doing? They were teaching a false plan of salvation. And so denominations today do not teach the same plan that Christ taught. Doctrines of men... The, man, the, man, the commandments of men are made of no effect because of the doctrines of, of men. Look at Matthew 15 and verse 6. Thus you have made the command of God of no effect by your tradition. Like we talked about last week, the hierarchy of some denominations that we have seen. If you were to go and look at their traditions, when I was a member of the Baptist church not too long before I had left it, I found a document that said the, it was called the bylaws of the church. I didn't pick it up at the time. I wish I would have, but now you can find it online and other places as well. And what it does is it outlines their beliefs on numerous different topics, different aspects and areas. Well, here's the question. Doesn't the Bible do that already? Doesn't the Bible already outline what we are to believe and adhere to and follow in every area of our life? Well, yes, it does. Therefore, the creeds of men should be done away with. But instead, we find in Matthew 15 and verse 6, Christ says here that they have made the command of God of no effect. That is, the command of God has become pointless 
because they're following the traditions of men. Isn't that what's happening today? People are following the traditions of men and ignoring the Word of God. How many times have you simply read a verse to someone or quoted a verse to someone and they say, well, I know what the Bible says, but I believe. Well, so what? If our personal beliefs are not in line with the Word of God, then our personal beliefs are wrong. Amen. We have to make sure that our beliefs are what God has said. You know, if I wanted to hold to personal beliefs, any of us want to hold to personal beliefs, we could not be a member of the body of Christ. Because God has spoken on what we are to adhere to, how we are to live, how we are to act, how we are to speak. Every aspect of life is found within the Word of God, including salvation. Salvation is only by the authority of Christ. Man can say all he wants about salvation and man can still be wrong. You look at Hebrews chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. The Bible says, Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Having, having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who what? Acknowledge him? No. All those who accept him? No. All those who obey him? Obey is a word that people today still do not understand. Because they take that word, they read that verse, and they say, see, all you have to do is just accept Him. No, that's not what the verse says at all. You have to obey Him, which is literally meaning you do what Christ has commanded. Can you imagine telling your parents as a child when they tell you to do something, you say, well, I accept what you have said, but you don't do it? That wouldn't work at all, would it? We know what would happen, yet we have those today who try it with the Bible. And they try it with Christ. We must obey Him. He is the author of eternal salvation to all who obey Him. And you could say by clearly by what the verse is telling us, He's the author of salvation to only to those who obey Him. If you don't obey Christ, He cannot grant you salvation. Why? Because you have not fulfilled the requirements to be granted salvation. Look at John chapter 14 and verse 6. We find here that salvation is only in the truth that is in Christ. John 14, 6, Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now there are several lessons we can learn from this verse without ever going against what Christ has said. First of all, we have to realize that we're going to come to God, that is the Father. We have to do it in the ways in which Christ has said we ought to do it, to have to do it. That means we cannot come to, to the Father, that is where the Father is in heaven, unless we do things the, in the way that Christ has commanded. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now he's not talking about merely accepting Him and saying now you can come to the Father. He's talking about as we see throughout the New Testament, throughout the Gospel accounts, if you're going to have heaven as your home, you have to do all that Christ has commanded. That's why the New Testament law sometimes is referred to as the law of Christ, because that's whose law we're under. The law of Christ given to him by God the Father, of course, but we are under the New Testament law. Christ and Christ alone has the authority to set the terms of, salv of salvation and not man. In Matthew 28, verse 18, Christ says, There all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. No one else on the face of the planet, and no matter what time here we're talking about, can make that statement and it be true. Only Christ had the ability to say that all authority has been given to him in heaven and on earth. That tells us that what Christ says goes. And nothing else. How amazing it is that men don't realize how arrogant and how pompous they are when they try to change the Word of God. You see men try to redefine things and use different terms and try to get around what the Word of God has said. It doesn't change what it has said. 
But let's think about some false teachings on salvation. We won't spend a whole lot of time on this because we could spend hours if we really wanted to. The first one we want to simply notice is just accept Christ. I've always wondered, what does that even mean? Growing up in the Baptist denomination, I thought, okay, you accept Christ. You acknowledge Him as the Son of God. What else? You live a Christian life? Well, you don't really have to because once you're saved, you're always saved, right? You have to repent of sin? Well, you know, grace will cover your sins. Just accept Christ doesn't even fit what the Bible says anywhere in the Scriptures. Nowhere has someone just accepted Christ as the Son of God and that been enough. Is, accepting, is, it, is it accepting Christ if it's not Christ's plan? Can you accept, accept Christ as the Son of God if you're not even doing what He has told you to do? This is just one way of teaching faith only or faith alone. Just accept Christ Others will say, well, just say, uh, say this prayer. And I forgot to have these up here. Just say this prayer, and later, we can baptize you later if you want. And I can remember having this study with now my father-in-law. And we were sitting down, we were talking about this. And he was saying, well, are you, you know, when were you saved? And I told him about the time. He said, well, when, were you, when were you baptized? Because, you know, in a Baptist church, it's not the same time, is it? Being saved, being baptized happens at two different times in many denominations. Well, that's not what the Bible teaches, is it? Well, how can we say that we can be baptized later if we want to? Because there are those today who will feed you the line that baptism is just an outward sign of a, quote, inward working. I Meaning, you know, baptism is just showing that you have been saved. I thought that was a Christian life that showed you've been saved, wasn't it? Baptism is part of God's plan of salvation. It's not a result of salvation. We are baptized in order to be saved, not because we are saved. If we have those, again, he'll say it's just an outward sign. You know, there are numerous reasons why people say that. One is because... It's a tradition that's been passed down and it's just ingrained in their brain and you can't get it out. Others, because maybe their, their family, their friends have not been baptized according to the New Testament. And so if they didn't believe that, it would condemn all their family and friends who also were baptized as an outward sign. So emotions become part of it. But whatever reason it may be that we have that idea... It is not in agreement with the Word of God. We cannot be saved any way that we want. We are only saved when we do what Christ has commanded us to do. In Mark 16 and verse 16, the Bible says, He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. It is mind-boggling. There are still those who will use this verse and say, See, you don't have to be baptized. What book are you reading? That's exactly what Christ just said. And they say, well, it doesn't say if you're not baptized, you'll be condemned. It doesn't have to, because if you don't believe, you're never going to be baptized, right? You don't have to move on to point two if someone won't get past point one, do you? He who believes and is baptized. You know, the person who truly believes in Christ as the Son of God truly acknowledges who he is and he has authority, will not blink an eye at being baptized, will they? They will do it straight away. In fact, we find that in the book of Acts when people were, were converted, we find they were baptized immediately or the same hour, which basically means as soon as possible they could find a place to baptize them. They were baptized. And why would you wait? You know, why are people fighting baptism? Well... Grandpa wasn't baptized. Mother wasn't baptized. Some of you have heard for all these years. Now my pastor used to say, so what? Pastor says there's a lot of things that have no place in the Lord's church. It cannot be found in the Bible at all. We must realize that we have to do what Christ has commanded. So many people today will not go to heaven 
because of this fear of water, because of this fear of baptism. The fear to truly submit to the most debated point in God's plan. We have to remember it is God's plan. It's not our plan. We cannot have things as we wish they were. And why would we fight so desperately against what God has commanded? We just simply need to obey, submit, and know that when we do what God has commanded, we don't have to worry about anything else. Because when we obey God, we become pleasing to God. Before we move on to our next point about what is God's plan, I can remember years ago, it was about probably a few weeks after I was converted, I ran into an old Baptist youth minister I'd known for a long time outside of a video store and inside we were talking and, you know, just about everything under the sun. Get out to the car, get ready to leave. And he says, oh, by the way, you think your loved one's going to heaven? It wasn't, why don't you leave the church? It wasn't, you know, can we talk about this sometime? It was one question. Do you think you're the only one that's going to heaven? And now looking back, I think there was a whole lot of probably anger behind that, frustration, and a whole lot of misunderstanding as well. Now as a new convert, I said what I, what I could think of the best. I simply said, well, those who do what the Bible says are going to go to heaven. We kind of laughed and walked away. But isn't that true? Some, say, some, some people, they will ask, do you think you're, you, that is, members of the Lord's church, are loyal ones going to heaven? And I'll say no, because there are those in the Lord's church who are not going to heaven. There are those in the Lord's church who have been members maybe for years because of their lifestyle, because of different things. They may claim to be a member of the Lord's church. They're not going to heaven. They're sitting in their life. It hasn't been taken care of. They're not going to heaven. That's why the best and most correct answer is those who do what the Bible has commanded of them will go to heaven. And it begins at the Lord's church. Are those denominations going to heaven? Well, how could they? How can someone who has obeyed a tradition or a doctrine of men go to heaven? They haven't obeyed Christ. They've obeyed man. Well, let's look at God's plan for man's salvation. First, let's realize that God's plan is clear and it is straightforward. Whenever you talk with someone who is very sincere and really wants to know what the truth is, one of the things you'll see in their eyes and their reaction is how simple it really is. You know, the Lord's church and the Bible in general, the commands of God, are not complicated. It's only when men are allowed to bring in their traditions, their ideas, and their opinions, that things begin to get foggy. But when you push all that stuff aside, it becomes clear as a sunshiny day, doesn't it? What is God's plan for man's salvation? Well, you cannot, cannot obey what you have not heard, so the first thing you have to do is you have to hear. You have to hear God, God's plan for, for you. That is, you have to hear the gospel. Romans 10, verse 17, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. This goes against predestination, doesn't it? There are those who say, well, some are predestined to go to heaven and some are not. Boy, that's a really uplifting, isn't it? But if you're on the wrong side, there's nothing you can do about it. So we must hear, God says. We must hear before we can do anything else. Faith comes by hearing. Not only do we hear, but hearing implies that we also learn from what we have heard. We see this in John 6 and verse 45. It is, it is written in the prophets, and they shall be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. When you hear, you learn. Therefore, that puts you on to the next step, doesn't it? The next step is what? Well, the next step is believing. You must believe in Christ as the Son of God, not a God, not one of the many gods, but you must believe in Him as the Son of God. Here in John 8, in verse 24, Christ says, Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, for if you do not believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. That's pretty straightforward, isn't it? That's why I said God's plan is pretty clear and straightforward. Believe in me as the Son of God or you're going to die in your sins. It doesn't get any clearer than that. 
We hear, we believe, and then what else must we do? We must repent. And all these are logical points, aren't they? They're not, we're not asking, or God's not asking for you to do anything that you cannot do. When someone says you got to speak in tongues for you can remember here, you cannot do it unless you're a liar. You cannot do it. God does not require something from us that we cannot do. Third, you must repent of your sins. Now we must realize as we talk about this point, there are things that we can do and those things which we are just simply not willing to do. When we get to repentance, there are some of those who are not willing to do so. Notice Acts 26 and verse 20. But declared first to those in Damascus and Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent, turn to God and do works befitting repentance. What happens before they turn to God? They are to repent. They acknowledge they are in sin and get out of it. You cannot come to God holding your sins in your arms saying, take me just as I am. That's how some people interpret that song we sing, just as I am. You come to God as a sinner, but you don't stay that way. If you do, you're not going to stay with God, are you? Because Isaiah 59 verse 2 tells us sin separates us from God. So it's not possible to come to God as a sinner and stay a sinner. We must repent of our sins. And then what must we do next? We must confess. We must confess, confess Christ as the Son of God. And some will take verses to talk about confessing Christ as the Son of God and say, see, there's the sinner's prayer. No, that's not it. Someone confessing Christ as the Son of God is not the same as praying for salvation because you believe Christ is the Son of God. Acts 8 verse 37 says, And Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. He answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He believes and he confesses it with what? With his mouth. That Christ is the Son of God. Number five, we must be immersed for, that is the purpose of, for the remission of sins. Not because of the remission of sins, but for the remission of sins. Acts 22 and verse 16 says, And now, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And some will take that last phrase and sing, See, this call on the Lord. What is he calling on the Lord to do? To, wash, to remove his sins. How is he going to do that? Through baptism. So through baptism, he's calling on God to wash away his sins, isn't he? That's pretty simple. No, 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 that's not what it means. Yes, it is what it means. He was baptized, and as he was baptized, he was calling on God to wash away his sins by what? By his obedience to the command to be baptized. It wasn't a prayer. It was an action. He was calling on the Lord to wash away his sins as he was baptized. And that's exactly what happened, Acts 2, verse 38. At the same time, when a person is baptized... Something else also happens. They are placed into the body of Christ. You notice there's nothing special that you have to do, is there? Fill out this form so we can deduct your account? No. Do this, do that? No. What? You are baptized. You're now part of the body of Christ, which is the church. Galatians 3, verse 26 and 27. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. This is another verse we would like to read and stop at. See, we're all sons through faith. Faith only. No, read, keep reading. People today come away with false ideas because they stop reading. Look at verse 27. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You are baptized into Christ. And how could it be optional for people today? Because it's not. It is not an option. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You are now what? A part of the body of Christ. You are now part of the church. Singular. But you know, that's not the last point, is it? I get frustrated sometimes when I see people in their plan of salvation on their website and they stop at baptism. Is that the last step? Is that all you have to do? I'm baptized. I've done it. That's not it, is it? We must remain faithful to God. All of our lives. We must repent of our sins when we do fall short and remain faithful to God. Without remaining faithful to God, nothing else matters. We can be baptized, but if we walk away from Christ, you're just going to go right back into the world. 
Once saved, always saved, only works if you remain faithful to God. Then yes, you can be always saved if you remain faithful to God. But the second you stop being faithful to God, you're not saved any longer. When we walk away from Christ, we have to stop believing, well, I'm still saved. Why would God accept you, those who have walked away? We have to make sure that we have to remain faithful to God. John 14, verse 15 says, If you love me, keep my commandments. That's talking about obedience, isn't it? If you love me. Well, what does God's plan mean to those, to those in denominations? And I said, what do, you, what do you mean by that? What does God's plan mean to those in denominations? Well, since they teach error in or on salvation, logic says there are no Christians in denominations because there's only one church, and when a person is baptized, they're placed into the body of Christ, not to denomination, so therefore there are no Christians in denomination. Right? Matthew 16, verse 18, Christ said he built his church, singular. We're added to the body of Christ, Galatians 3.27. We're not added to the denomination. No, in fact, if you remember the Baptist church, you've got to be voted on. You better hope you have some friends and nobody's mad at you. If so, you're not going to be a member of that congregation. We have to remember, no matter how kind a person is, no matter even maybe if they're a moral person, they don't drink, they don't, you know, they condemn sexual morality and fornication and things such as that. All that is good and fine, but if they're not a member of the, Lord's, of the Lord's church, they're not going to have heaven as their home. Why would God accept someone who is in a division that is following the creeds of men? That's what he condemned in Matthew 15, wasn't he? In vain did they worship me? Why was it vain? Because they're following the creeds and traditions of men. He says they're the doctrines of men. But here in Matthew 16, verse 18, Christ says, And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock, that is what? His statement that Christ is the Son of God, back in the previous verse, he says, I will build my church. On what? On the foundation that I am the Son of God. And he says, And the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. One singular church. Despite what some may believe and teach, God's grace does not cover doctrinal error. We are not willing to come out of doctrinal error or any error, then God's grace is not going to cover it. God's grace covers sins that we repent of. You hear people say all the time, well, I think God's grace is just going to cover it. Are you going to repent of it? No, I think God's grace is going to cover it. Well, then no, it's not. Well, how do we know that? Because God commands all men everywhere to repent. And so for that reason, we have to realize that God's grace only covers the sins that have been repented of. Matthew chapter 3 and verse 8. Therefore bear fruits worthy repentance. That tells us you cannot stay in denomination. If you have been baptized and obeyed the gospel, you can't go back to that denomination and be a part of it. Why would you want to in the first place? We have to bear fruits worthy repentance and walk away from those traditions in which we have followed. But there are those today, even within the Lord's church, and say, well, you know, if they have obeyed, if they have been baptized for the right reason, then they can be a member of a congregation, even if I don't want to attend where they are. Friends, obeying man's plan of salvation is not obeying God's plan for salvation. We have to realize we're going to get to heaven. We have to do it God's way and stop trying to do it our own way. There are some today who teach that you do not have to attend the church of Christ to be saved. The saved have are only found in the body, the body of Christ, which is the church. Have we know that? Look at Ephesians 5, verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of what? The, how many churches is that? One. The church, and he is Savior of the what? Of the body. He is Savior of the body, which is a reference to the church. So he's the Savior of the church. Which church? His only. Therefore, what? There is salvation in no other church, is there? Because there is no such thing as other churches. There's no salvation in denominations. How can you find salvation following the creeds of men? You cannot. 
Thus, teaching of the body of Christ, the church, is not important. It's going against the word of God. To have salvation, one must return to the Bible and follow the plan from God found in its pages. Only we obey what God has commanded will we do, will we become what God wants us to become, a follower of him. Where did the term Christian come from? Those who are followers of Christ, right? Well, how can someone be a follower of Christ and follow the ideas and the traditions and the creeds and all these other things that have begun with man? Aren't they, you know, there's a reason we say Baptist because they follow the Baptist doctrine, right? We will say that, well, I'm a Baptist. I wouldn't say that proudly. I don't mean that to be rude. But you're admitting you follow the creeds of the Baptist church and not the Bible. We will say, well, we follow the Bible. Why do you have creed books? Um, right? Salvation is only in one place, the body of Christ. We can turn to God in obedience or turn to man in stiff-necked rebellion. We'll either obey God or we'll obey men. But friends, let us be clear, as we've already talked about this morning, if we want to have heaven as our home, there's only one road that leads that way. And Christ mentions that in the book of Matthew as well, doesn't he? It's not the broad path that so many people are on today. It's the narrow path that leads to the heavenly home. This morning, as you think about these things, we can encourage you anyway, pray for you, whatever your need may be. You can come forward now. That's going to be saying, sing the song that's been selected.